Good morning, everyone. The blessing of God upon you. Welcome. A warm welcome to everyone um, that's joined us uh, from wherever you may be. May God bless you once again. Um, so, uh, Pastor Yvonne has already prayed for the word. Um, I trust you enjoyed the worship, by the way. Um, and you'll find that now on Facebook, we um, are joining up the worship. So you're going to find the the worship, uh, sorry, the words immediately following the worship. So it will be like one service on, on, on Facebook. But YouTube, because of copyright reasons, we are separating it. Uh, we're not actually putting the worship on. Nevertheless, let us bow our heads as we um, go to the communion table. And I trust that you have your communion, communion emblems ready. And I heard you that you should be doing this every single week as we do it, as we used to do it in church also, because um, it is vitally important to remember what the Lord has done. So let us bow our heads as we continue. Thank you, Lord. Father, we glorify your holy name. Blessed be the name of the living God. I thank you, Lord God Almighty, that even now it is possible for us to share the Holy Communion together. And in the various homes that the emblems have been placed, that which represents the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus over all of these emblems, and I dedicate it and I consecrate it, that it becomes in the spirit, the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ. And Lord, this morning as we drink and we eat together, sharing with one another, we do this in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. We remember you, we remember you, Lord, for your great sacrifice. We take this not lightly, for as we drink and we eat, we truly remember you, Father. We remember you, Lord. We remember as you went to the cross on Calvary and willingly laid down your life as a final sacrifice for our sins, giving us access. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. We remember you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. As we drink and we eat, we remember Jesus. We thank you for the blood and the body of Christ, that mighty blood of Jesus and the body of Christ. As it goes through our physical bodies, I speak and declare this morning that by the power of the Holy Spirit, all disease, from all of us that partake this morning is eliminated and gotten rid of from our bodies by the power in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us and leading us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may partake. Thank you. Um, hey, good morning uh, to those of just joined us now. Welcome to every one of you. And um, as we go into the word, um, you know, in the time that we live in, everything is changing. And we need to, in a manner of speaking, up our game, step up our faith. For God is able, God is willing, and God loves us. So I'm going to read from John, the book of John, chapter 11. A well-known story, John chapter 11. It's a story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, it's pretty long. It's about 44 verses. So I'm not going to read the entire thing, but we'll be referring to this verses in between. Just a portion here and there, those that, um, that pertain to the message. And um, I urge you to read the whole thing later on. So John 11 verse 1. Now a certain man, I'm reading, sorry, excuse me, from the uh, King James Version. 
Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with an ointment and wiped his feet with their hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, but he sent a word unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we're going to skip down. And um, going down to the 14th verse, when Jesus spoke unto his disciples, and he said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, but I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. To that intent ye may believe, nevertheless let us, let us go unto him. And um, going down to, as Jesus made his way unto, to Bethany, 20th verse, Matthew 11 verse 20, And then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. And then said Mary unto Jesus, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been, had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever that thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. I'll read that again. But I know that even now, whatsoever that thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. And then Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And going down a bit further on, um, when he came to the tomb, and there you'll find, um, yes, sorry, go down to verse 36, verse 37, sorry. And when the Jews spoke and they said, and some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? And therefore, and Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, If thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hast hearest my prayers, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. So I'm going to speak to you, as you can see, the title of the uh, of the message. Let me just open my... Okay. As you can see, the title of the message, which says, Even now it is possible. Very pertinent for what we're going through as a society, as a world, where people now are becoming so downcast, as I said last week, sadly, even Christians, and thinking that everything is changing. God has not changed. Because as it was possible before, it is still possible. Even now, it is possible. What is possible? Absolutely everything. God is the God of the impossible. So John 11, verses 1 to 44 talks about the entire story about <clears throat> the death and the, and the resurrection of Lazarus. The verse to highlight, if I could highlight any verse from that, would be verse 22, where Mary said, But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give unto you. The faith that, sorry, that the words that Martha said, the faith that Martha displayed was exemplary. The kind of faith that moves mountains, that raises the dead, as it happened in this case. Now, the story is an example of how faith plays out in our lives. And if you look at the biblical definition of faith, and everyone would know this, which is found in Hebrews 11 verse 1, 
The Amplified Version gives it a bit of a broader description, which I'll read. Now, faith is the assurance or the title deed of the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact which cannot be experienced by our physical self, which, which can't be that which cannot be experienced by our physical senses. So faith is, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. But with all the assurances itself, faith by itself is dead unless you mix it with action. Action is like a catalyst for faith. That's why in James 2 verse 17, it says, So to faith, if it does not have works to back it up, it is by itself dead, which is inoperative and ineffective. So to continue to have the impossible in your life come to pass, you must have faith. Because the impossible will require God to move. And God moves when there's faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without his faith it is impossible to walk with God and please him. And whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those that earnestly and diligently seek him. So faith pleases God, and when God is pleased, things happen. An action, the right type of action, is a catalyst for faith. So many of us are seeking miracles or seeking answers from God. We may have the faith, but often we neglect or we don't know how to apply the basic principles that activates the faith, that catalyzes it. Now some background about the story that I read, it's not a parable, an actual story. Jesus knew Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. He visited the home. You read about that in Luke 10, verse 39. And we're going to speak about how to activate the faith, what happened in the story, how we can apply it in our lives to get the answers that we are seeking for, miracles that we are seeking for. I must say there's been amazing growth among the people in the ministry that have been associated, that we associated with wonderful things. People that could not pray much are praying now and praying more preaching sharing the word fasting wonderful things and all these things are producing amazing breakthroughs so many of them have had wonderful breakthroughs so the question would be what are the things we would need to do to activate or to get the kind of miracle such as raising the dead for example the first thing to realize is when, you know, when Mary and Martha, when they knew that Lazarus was sick, the first thing that they did was call upon Jesus because they had the confidence to know that he would respond. Now, the first thing that we need to do whenever we have a problem or we're seeking an answer or we're faced with a challenge is to call upon Jesus. It will normally be evident when you are faced with a sudden situation, a sudden thing where your automatic response, you know, when someone, if something comes near your eye, there's an automatic response to shut, to blink your eyelids. It's natural, it's automatic. That's the kind of response that we should have. When we're faced with a problem, challenge, we need direction, our instant response our instant action should be call upon Jesus. As Mary and Martha called upon Jesus, we need to know and understand that we should call upon Jesus. The first words of words out of your mouth should be Jesus. And the moment you say Jesus, you are his child. Instantly, he's able to hear you. So the way you would, you would only be able to call upon Jesus if you know him, if you have a relationship with him, you walk on the street, you're driving on the street and you see people walking by. If you open the window and you want to call them, you don't even know their name because they're strangers. Jesus should never be a stranger. He's your God. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. We need to have a personal relationship with him. And when you have a personal relationship with him, by instinct, you will learn to call upon him. And calling upon Jesus is prayer. Calling upon Jesus is prayer. Prayer is vital. We say this all the time. And we all know this. Prayer or speaking to God or having a conversation with God is important. It is vital. 
calling to God no matter what. Your instinct to call upon your Lord in times of trouble, in times of challenges, in times when you're seeking direction, calling upon God. If you look at the story about, <clears throat> I'm not going to refer to that. I'm not going to go to the but blind Bartimaeus in Mark, found in Mark 10, 46. When blind Bartimaeus called upon Jesus, there were those that even tried to stop him from calling. They told him, keep quiet. Likewise, sometimes our very own might stop you from calling on Jesus. But your job, your function, your instinct should be call upon Jesus no matter what you are faced with. And calling upon Jesus is your first step, your first step in trying to achieve, achieve a miracle. Your first step in activating your faith, your faith, is call upon Jesus. Sometimes, you know, like blind Bartimaeus, he was stopped. They stopped him from calling upon Jesus. Sometimes in church, we might foolish, might feel foolish going for prayer. Fair enough, sometimes... You know what, prayer, you could pray as much as you want to. You can come for prayer as much as you want to. But sometimes people feel foolish or afraid to go to the altar for prayer. We don't have that situation anymore for the time being temporarily. God has somehow brought this to pass so we go to him in prayer ourselves personally. So, But we should never feel foolish or that we're asking too much. You are a child to God. So go to God in prayer. Your first step in trying to achieve your miracle is to call upon Jesus, calling upon the Lord, the Lord of the universe. Going on from that point, the reason that Martha and Mary called upon Jesus was because they knew. They knew that he could heal Lazarus. We need to have the faith to know that Jesus is the solution for everything. All that you face, your faith must be rooted in Jesus, no matter what happens. Trusting him and knowing that he is a solution for all. There is nothing, there is absolutely nothing that you can face that God can't see you through. No sickness, no financial problem, no legal problem, no marital problem. No problem. Nothing is too big for him. We need to remember, and people say this often, that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. You'll find that... In Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing that he can fix anything, I have no doubt that he planned everything for you. He's the author of your life. He knows when it will finish. When you have no doubt that the Lord is able, you will call upon him with faith because knowing that he will fix your problem as Eve sees it best. You will instinctively call upon the Lord. So Mary and Martha knew that if they call upon Jesus, which they did, he will heal Lazarus. Going on from that point, wrong answer or no answer. Now that's something that we need to always, often we are faced with this. So they sent for Jesus and they waited. But Lazarus got sicker and Jesus did not come. And then Lazarus died. So in the, instead of things getting better, it got worse. So they called upon Jesus with faith. But instead of things getting better, it got worse. How many times do we face situations like that? Where we are desperate and we don't know what to do. Sometimes we fast and we pray. We call upon the Lord and we believe. We wait upon the Lord, but no answer comes. Or worse still, it goes from bad to worse. For example, we pray for promotion and instead we lose our job. We pray for finances and suddenly something goes wrong and we need more finances than before. It seems like instead of God answering our prayers, things get worse. We need to remember always that our faith will be tested. You know when a mechanic fixes your car, they take it for a test drive to see if it's fine. When you cook a meal, when you cook a meal, for example, when you cook a meal, sorry man, I've got a little notification coming up that I'm trying to stop. Okay, anyway, um, when you cook a meal, you will taste it. You see, the taste or to taste, to test its saltiness. 
Likewise, God tests your faith. Uh, tests your faith, rather. Apologies. God tests your faith. You say you believe. Let's see if you really do. For example, with Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice. God tested him. When things seem to be getting worse, our job and our faith shall stand and we should still trust him. We should still trust him no matter what. No matter what it may be, we should still trust God. Because we should know absolutely without a doubt that God is our solution. So we should, if we know without a doubt that God is our solution, we'll keep on going to the solution if we never let go. Because things may seem to get worse, Always remember, your faith will be tested. When you want something new, when you need to go to a new level, your faith will be tested. It's a natural part of Christian growth. So be prepared. Often your faith may be tested. When things seem you, you're fervently praying, you're walking right, fasting and asking God for a solution and things get worse. Our job is to hang in there. Remembering always that God is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's in full control. He knows what he's doing. So trust him and hang in there. You know, once Lazarus died, they could do nothing else from that point on. He had prayed. He had waited upon God. Nothing happened. So they released Lazarus. They put him in a tomb. But they still waited for Jesus. They had sent for him and they knew that he would come. See, when you pray and you ask God for help to sort out your problem, there's only so much you can do. You do what you could do. We always say, do the possible, leave the impossible to God. Pray, do what is necessary, and stop there. Don't try and fix it yourself. Don't interfere. Let it go. You give it to God, don't take it back. Let him have his way. Sometimes our interference delays or it can halt divine intervention. Our interference can sometimes delay or halt divine intervention. When you have known your heart, you've asked sincerely, you've called upon Jesus, you've asked with faith, you know he's able to do absolutely anything and everything that is your solution. There is nothing more you could do. Don't try and fix it yourself. Fixing it yourself can cause problems. Where people sometimes out of desperation. I'll use a financial um, example where they are praying for finances in a particular manner, trusting God did everything right. And because God is testing them, delays it, he knows his timing is perfect. They now, they are, God is not coming through and they go borrow the money and then they mess it up. Your interference could alter a divine miracle. No matter what seems to be happening, we release the problem to God and you wait upon him. You release and you wait. You can only really do that if you trust him and if you know that he is working on your behalf, that it's in his hands. And when Jesus came thereafter, after Lazarus had died, they all said it was too late actually. Even Martha said that. God is never late. He is always on time. In fact, the Bible says the Lord Jesus waited for two days and he then he left for Bethany. This entire story about Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus was a plan of God, as everything is. There was a plan of God here that was coming to pass. So when it seems that God delays, he has a plan because Jesus deliberately waited for two days. In the eyes of Martha and Mary, he was late. In the eyes of Jesus, it was perfect timing. So don't interfere. If there seems to be a delay, there is a divine reason. And God knows why. Don't get frustrated. Don't get impatient. Don't get worried. Don't get angry. God has a plan. If you trust in him, you can't get frustrated anyway. You can't get impatient. Because he knows best. His timing is perfect. You can't get worried or angry either. You may not know what the plan is. But know, have the assurance that the plan is in motion. Just believe. Keep on believing. And this is actually when Martha's faith in God really kicked in. Because Martha, and that's the verse I quoted initially, verse 22, and Martha said, Even now, 
I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. She trusted, even though she knew that Lazarus was dead because Jesus had arrived. See, when all hope is lost and the problem has gone from bad to worse, and there seems to be no hope of recovery, never give up. In this case, we're talking about the resurrection of, of, a, um, of a man that was dead for four days at that point. Sometimes people might think this is far-fetched. But I regularly hear of very anointed men, very powerful prophets. Even last night I was getting, listening to a sermon where I was reminded about David Hogan again. David Hogan, a man that worked among the um, in South America, an American guy, that literally has raised a thousand people or more from the dead. Now we might think this is now the story that we read about Lazarus is Bible times. A thousand people, this is not the now time. When the Bible speaks about, for example, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, that's the scripture he goes by. And we think leprosy, by the way, is no more existent. It is. By the way, it is. Leprosy still exists in certain parts of the world like India and in South America. So coming back to this, the story may, might seem far-fetched. It's still valid. And um, so going on from that, so Martha trusted, even though she knew Lazarus was dead. When all hope was gone and the problem has gone from worse, from bad to worse rather, there seems to be no hope of recovery because what can be worse than death? Never give up. Martha's most powerful words were said, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give unto you. Now Martha's faith now took a leap to a new level. She started to consider the impossible, that though my brother is dead, the Lord is here and the Lord can heal him. We need to be the same. Our faith needs to go radical. If things have gotten worse, your faith needs to strengthen more. We, we should know without a doubt that Jesus can heal, can deliver, can sort absolutely anything out. He's the God of the impossible. And Martha said, even now, and I'm saying unto you this morning, even now, whatever you faith, God can make a way. Even now, it's possible. There must be an even now, because even now will change the way you look at things. In our minds, no matter what, we should be saying, I know God can, even now, never give up. No matter how bad the situation is, night is never forever. Day must break. And as the morning breaks, so too will your breakthroughs come through. Now, when Jesus went to the tomb and he said, remove the stone, why did the Lord Jesus do that? He is God. He could have, he could move a mountain. He could have blinked his eyes, not even, and the stone could have disintegrated. But who put the stone there? It was Mary and Martha and her people. You see, when we release a problem to God, be aware that we don't put a huge stone on it block the solution. So now we've prayed, we've called upon Jesus, We've trusted God. We believe he can do anything. We have enough faith. Things seem to be getting worse. Be aware that there may be a stone that's blocking your miracle from coming to pass. I'll talk about that just now. So the stone was blocking the tomb. Remember also Lazarus could not have walked out of the grave if the stone was not removed. For the miracle to take place, the stone had to be removed. Sometimes the enemy also blocks your blessings by putting a stone on, or an obstacle on your path. But that's another sermon. Secondly, faith without works is dead. So no matter how much you pray when you believe, you must put action behind your faith. And the stone must be removed. The stone must be removed. No matter what, the stone has to be removed. So no matter what, the stone has to be completely removed. So, putting action behind your faith. For example, stop saying the economy is bad. COVID-19, every industry is affected. I say that. But when I say that to people, I know when I'm saying this, it does not apply to me. Every industry is affected. It makes no difference to God. 
do something. If you, need, if, you, if you, for example, if you need a job, look for one. Remember when Jesus, what Jesus said to the paralytic: "Take up your bed and walk." If you did not say, the man will still be on that bed. He said the told, said the blind man, instructed the blind man, after you put clay on, go wash in the river. Don't sit back, do something. Sometimes the final step to achieving your miracle after all the prayer is putting your faith into action. Doing something about it. As I said, it's a catalyst. It's a catalyst for the miracle. So watch out for stones that you may have put, knowingly or unknowingly, that may be blocking your breakthrough or your miracle. Check your lives for stones that you may have put in place that might be causing a blockage. Examine yourself. That example, I'll go through a few of them. Those things that we inadvertently, unknowingly, sometimes knowingly, have in our lives that are stones that block our blessing. For example, unconfessed sin. I speak about this very often. Learn to have a repentant heart. Approach God when you approach him. Approach with a repentant heart because we're all sinners. We sin every day. You know, that is not dependent on your, your entrance into heaven or your salvation. But when we love God, when we know him, when we understand him, we will always have a repentant heart because as many prophets in the Bible would say, I'm undone when they came into the presence of God. When they realize how sinful they really are in all the things that we do. So when you approach God, approach with a repentant heart. Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, and he will not hear your prayer. An unconfessed sin can be a stone that can block the answer. Unforgiveness can also can also block your breakthrough. It can be a stone that can halt or stop your miracle. Matthew 5, 23 to 24, where the Lord said, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and thou rememberest that thy brother at that thy brother at ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come out and offer thy gift. Don't hold grudges. Forgive as often as necessary as you have been forgiven. The Lord Jesus said, when he was asked, how many times should we forgive someone? Seven times? He said, 70 times seven, meaning as often as it's necessary, because that's exactly what God does for us. Forgiveness releases you, actually. So don't hold grudges against people. The Bible says, if you are, stop what you're doing, get, make right with your brother, then come back to me, meaning, God will not answer you. If you have been forgiven, refuse to forgive others. It's something to think about. We need to be able to forgive others. Forgiveness, as I said in the past, <clears throat> does not mean going back and subjecting you, yourself to the person that may have abused you. Forgiveness must be done. Sometimes you may not even meet the person, but you could forgive them. Sometimes I had to repent of of, uh, to forgive people that I probably would never see again in my life. But God reminded me of unforgiveness in my heart to someone that had done something bad to me 10 years ago. I have no way of contacting them. I have no way of knowing who they are. It's good enough if you really say, Lord, I forgive them. They may not hear you, but your heart, excuse me, Your heart must be sincere. There must be sincerity in what you say. So unforgiveness can be a stone that can block your miracle. Get over it. Forgive and move on. Another stone that's a problem, another thing that can be a stone is doubt. But that's of the faith principle. Mark 11 verse 24, it says, Therefore I say unto you, what things, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Not doubting. When you pray, the Bible speaks about childlike faith. You know, when we address children, I sometimes joke with Kelsa, and I could tell her almost anything, and she believed. The most ridiculous of things. 
because I'm her father and she believes that if I said it, it must be true. And then I'll tell her I'm just joking. That's the childlike faith the Bible refers to. We should understand, no, let's not say understand. We should know that God is able, capable and willing to do absolutely every good thing for you. No matter what, no matter how impossible it may seem, he's disabled. That's the kind of childlike faith we need to have. Believing God can do it. The only time he won't give you something if it's not in his will. Or something that's going to hurt you, for example. So don't doubt. Believe. As Martha believed when she saw Jesus, her faith went from healing to resurrection. Continuing from there, walking in obedience. Lack or walking in disobedience can be a problem. Striving after righteousness will never really be perfect. We're always sinning. We're always making mistakes. We're always saying the wrong things. We're always not saying the right things. We're neglecting to do things. But striving after righteousness. Proverbs 28 verse 9. You see, we're talking about knowing what God wants. That God wants you to be a good person, but you're being absolutely the opposite. God wants you to be kind, but you're being unusually cruel. Things like that. We always say this, and I find myself repeating this very often. We obey God as the Lord Jesus said, because you love me. You, you obey the Lord because you love him. You obey the commandments, that's which he said, things that you should be doing as he lived, because you love him. It's not because of salvation. You can't buy your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. It's purely by grace. So striving after righteousness. Proverbs, Proverbs 28 verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination to God. The law here refers to the word of God. If you're not adhering to what Jesus has said, the commands that Jesus gave, if you're disregarding the word of God, it's a problem. Because you won't walk in obedience. You'll do all things contrary to that. And if you're not walking in obedience, it can very well be a stone that can block your miracle. It can very well be a stone that can block your miracle. Going on from there, asking, asking according to his will. I'm referring to the stones now that block your miracle. John, 1 John 5 verses 4, 14, 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. You see, God knows best. Sometimes we ask for things. And in all our natural mind, with all our logic, with all our intelligence, with all our knowledge, we believe that this is the absolute best thing for us. There is something such as the perfect will of God or the allowed will of God. I'll use that word. God sometimes will allow you certain things. It may not be his perfect will, but that's another sermon. But coming back to this. So sometimes with all our logic and everything that we have inside us, we determine that that which we're asking for is must be the way. And But God who sees everything, who is above time, who knows the day you will pass away, who knows what's going, what you're going to be doing tomorrow or in 10 years' time, he knows that that is the absolute worst thing that, could, that he could give you. So you will withdraw it. You will not. And we don't understand. We say, Lord, I know this and I know this. Why aren't you giving it to me? It's very often because God knows that thing that you ask for will harm, will harm you. So that is why it's so vital to ask for the in the will of God as I just read in 1 John 5, verse 14, 15. Even the Lord's Prayer speaks about it. The Lord's Prayer speaks about it, which is, your will be done in heaven as it is in earth. I was also often questioned, and I spoke about this just now, about having a repentant heart when you go to God. Having a repentant heart, you know. I firmly believe, and I've practiced this for many years, that whenever I go into prayer, I will go into repentance. And I never really understood why, but I knew that it was something that the Holy Spirit will always convict me, and I'd go into repentance. I recognize that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. So I go into repentance as often as I go into prayer. Now it does not mean that 
the repentance guarantees my salvation. No, it does not. It does not. A sinner forgiven goes to heaven. Excuse me. A sinner unforgiven because of not or no belief in the Lord Jesus will go to hell. Simple as that. So the point I'm trying to make is we should be repenting regularly. And I was asking the Lord this week when I was speaking to someone who was ministering to a family on uh, Monday, I think it was, about daily repentance. And then the Holy Spirit reminded me of why. When we look at the Lord's Prayer, when the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught them the basic, simple Lord's Prayer, which on everything, all prayer is basically built up. Which is our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sinners as we forgive those that sin against us. Give us this day our daily bread. The point here I'm trying to make is that was a daily prayer. This is how you pray on a daily basis. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us our sins daily. Asking for forgiveness daily. Forgiving others daily. And the Lord reminded me that as often as we go into him, go to him rather, which should be at least once a day, we should go with hearts of repentance, we should go with hearts that have forgiven others. So going on from that, and finally, with regard to stones, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Don't ever go to God with an attitude of pride, thinking that you have made it, that you are the most blessed person, even if you are, that everything, you know what, as much as God's as God giveth, he can take it away. Watch out. Guard against pride. Don't ever go to God with an attitude of pride because God hates pride. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Don't you want grace? As opposed to resistance. If you remember the story about the Pharisee and the tax collector that both prayed. One prayed, the Pharisee prayed out of pride saying, I don't do this. Look at me. I don't do this. I do that. I do all the right things. I'm not even like the guy there that's standing next to me, that sinner who's praying. And the Lord eventually said, whose prayer was justified or received by God? It was the sinner that went into went with a humble heart, with a repentant heart. He was forgiven and his prayer was answered. Recognize that you are dealing with God. Humble yourself under his mighty hand. There have been so many scriptures I've been getting throughout the fast words where, where God was saying, where the scripture I read was, Who is man that God is mindful of him? I would say unto God, Lord, who am I that you are so mindful of me, that you love me so much as he does every one of us? Who am I? We are not even a microscopic, not even a microscopic speck in the universe that God created. Not even a microscopic speck. That God is mindful of us. Recognize. Recognize that. That we are so small in comparison to a mighty God. Who rules and who created the universe. The Lord God most high. We are so tiny in front of him. So small. So insignificant. Yet he loves us. He worries about me. He hears us. But still. Go to God with a humble heart. Your final stone. Going to God with pride. Will never get your prayer that prayer is answered. Humility. And then from that point, after the stone was removed, Jesus looked up, recognizing that God is answered, God the Father was answered. We need to understand. Look up from whence cometh your help, but recognize that God is your solution. Looking up would be praying. In my mind, look up. Where do you where is your help coming from? It's not the bank. It's not the car, it's not whatever. Look up from whence cometh your help. And then the Lord Jesus thanked the Father. He thanked the Father and then Lazarus was resurrected. resurrected. As we started the prayer program, uh, the fasting and the part of the prayer, which I didn't make a big thing of it this week because the power of confession, which we're going to talk about just now, was starting with the repentance, which is so vital as I spoke about, and having a heart of gratitude, a heart of thanksgiving. There was a whole lot of prayer points. There were selected scriptures from the Bible which speak about thanking God. So having a heart of gratitude. 
really knowing and thanking God. All our prayer, prayer programs start with repentance and thanksgiving. And then Jesus, after he thanked the Lord, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the impossible happened. The dead came back to life. Now we are not Jesus. We are his disciples. In his name, the impossible can take place. The dead can come back to life. No situation is too difficult for him. I should not have said lastly. The last thing was call out your miracle. As Jesus called, Lazarus come forth. We have the power to say, miracle come forth. Finances come forth. Healing come forth. And so on. Use the power of your tongue to call in your blessings. Use the power of your tongue to call in your blessings. And that's what we did this last week when I spoke about, the this past week rather, with the confession that I sent. Call those things or calling those things that are not as if they are. You know, I said at the beginning, when I started this message, that the faith that Martha displayed was exemplary. The kind of faith that moves mountains, that raises the dead. That's true. But we need to remember that Martha's faith may have been great, but it could have been a whole lot better. We need to go higher. Let me explain to you why, why I say that. Have you ever considered why did Jesus <clears throat> not heal Lazarus from where he was? I don't know the exact distance, but Jesus had to walk, I would assume, a day or two. Because he waited two days and it took four days to reach there. So I assume it took two days of walking, journey by walking, to go to Lazarus. And then Lazarus was resurrected. Why did Jesus not heal Lazarus from where he was? Because he did in the past. If you remember the story about the, the uh, centurion and his servant. When the centurion, uh, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the scripture reference, but you can look it up. The centurion who approached Jesus. And he said, my servant was sick. He sent a message actually to Jesus. My servant is sick. And he wanted healing. And then he sent a message saying, Don't come. Say the word. And as I am a commander in the army, if you say the word, you will be healed. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus not, did not even say the word. Taught the thought in his mind, in the mind of God. And that servant was healed. That's all the centurion said. Speak. And it will happen. Now, that is a different level of faith. That is a different level of faith. Mary and Martha, however, could have said a word, sent a word to Jesus saying, <clears throat> Lord, the one that you love, Lazarus is sick. Say the word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Say the word <clears throat> and you will be healed. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they did not. They called for Jesus. The disciples even said. They who walked with Jesus and saw him doing so many miracles. They did not even understand what was happening. And therefore, the Lord said in John uh, when the 15th verse, John 11, 15. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there. So that you might believe. Let us go to him. Our faith must be higher than that of Martha, like the centurion. It has to be, because the Lord Jesus is not physically here anymore. We call on, upon him in faith. And that's what Jesus said about the centurion. If you look in Matthew 8, for, yes, sorry, it was in Matthew 8, verse 10. <clears throat> when Jesus heard what the centurion said, he was amazed. That's what the Bible says. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and he said unto those following him, Truly I say unto you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Referring to the centurion's faith. You remember, we need to remember, we need to do what's possible. Ask God for the impossible. In the name of Jesus. Life can come into any dead situation by the hand of God. There are possibly even greater things than raising the dead, by the way. Because the Lord Jesus raised the dead and he said, greater things than that you will do. 
So remember, the, the biblical or the definition of faith, as I said originally, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's the King James Version. Faith is the essence of our trust in God, and we have never seen God. Yet we trust, yet we believe, yet we have hope, and yet we have faith in Him. How do you receive faith? Well, we all know faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. Do you feel at this point do you don't have enough faith? What do you do? Luke 22, verse 32. What do you do if you don't have faith? Or you don't have enough faith? You know what? The Lord Jesus knew that Peter would deny him. He prayed for his faith to be strengthened. When the Lord Jesus knew that Peter would deny him, he prayed for his faith to be strengthened. If you want, if you want your faith to go grow stronger, pray. Read the word. Pray. God. Faith is a gift from God. God gives it to you. Ask him to increase. So today I want to ask you, as we come to the end, what is the dead situation in your life that needs resurrection this morning? What is the dead situation in your life that needs resurrection? And to that situation, have you called on Jesus? Have you asked in prayer? Do you truly believe, no matter how impossible that situation, no matter how dead it may be, that God can resurrect that area of your life? Are there any stones that may be blocking the answer? Unforgiveness? Not being repentant, as I said, and all those things? Or have you given up hope, maybe? Because it is not getting better, it seems to be getting worse. Have you really looked up at God, the, the author and the finisher of your faith? Have you thanked God? Have you, are you a person that has a heart of thanksgiving? Or are you just a person that always wants and wants? Forgetting that which is given you and always looking and wanting. And if he's delaying for his divine reasons, you get cross and angry, upset, frustrated, worried. Have you thanked God? Are you a thankful person? <clears throat> Have you called out your miracle? The power of your tongue in the name of Jesus. There are amazing things that happen. Have you called out your miracle? The power on your tongue is amazing. You know when we do deliverance, which we have not done publicly for some time, from the time of the lockdown, I've done it on the phone recently. All we're going to do is look at a demon-possessed person or manifestation and say them and tell, speak unto it and command it in the name of Jesus to leave and will leave by the power of the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, but in the name of Jesus. So no matter what I do, I have to speak it. I can't look at a demon manifestation, stare them in the eye, not say a word. It will probably stare back at me. Nothing will happen. The power of confession or confessed prayer Confess warfare, spiritual warfare, cannot be overstated. So confess, calling in those things, calling your blessings, calling those things that are not as if they were believing in faith, that the God that you serve, the God of the impossible, will come through. Calling this positive confession all the time, calling in that. I started doing that again as part of our fast in regard to our business. And I'm always amazed at this. I would barely say these things and sometimes I would confess prayer points that I formulated 10 years ago. And there's one, one I did yesterday of our business. And before the end of the day, I had someone from even Zimbabwe that had sent me messages looking for, for assistance with regard to what I do. And lastly, the final question would be, do you realize that even now it's possible Despite the lockdown, despite it could be World War Three, even now it's possible. The economy could be down, unemployment could be 90%, even now it's possible. Everyone could be struggling, even now it's possible. Because the God that you serve is the God of the universe. Even now it's possible. So I urge you this morning, no matter what you face, no matter what the problem is, no matter how difficult the situation is, how tough the challenge is to consider those things, the principles that were outlined in 
in John 11. And I urge you to read John 11, 1 to 44, the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. I never fail to put those things in practice. Everything, if you consider the reason why Jesus could have, even though Mary and Martha did not ask, or oh, say the word, Lord, from where you are, heal him. Even though they call for him, Jesus, in his divinity, as God of the universe, could have thought the thought and instantly Lazarus could have been healed. Why did Jesus choose to go through the whole thing? There were many truths, but he did say the Lazarus' death is for the glory of God, so God's glory could be shown through him. It was all a part of what God planned. As I said many, two months ago, the way Jesus lived is the way we need to live. The things he did is what we need to do. So often he would do things to teach us this is how you would handle things or handle a situation when you are presented with it. He didn't need to go and heal Lazarus. He could have died from where he was. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was born, he could have, as soon as he became an adult or even younger, he could have went straight to the cross. Why did he live for 33 and a half years, minister for three and a half years, teaching, living life? All the things he did, all the things he practiced when he lived, is what we need to practice. The evidence of the entire story of the resurrection of Lazarus was to show us how we need to handle this situation. When we face something impossible, when it gets worse, how to do it, what to do. So I'll leave you with that. And I trust whatever situation that you may be facing, whatever problem, whatever challenge, that you will apply this. I will send you a breakdown if you want. If anyone wants a breakdown in terms of those things that can affect or stones that can block our answers and things that we need to put into practice to ensure that we are doing or creating the right atmosphere for the miracle that we seek, the breakthrough that we seek to occur. God bless you. So we're going to close our eyes in prayer. And uh, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for holding uh, those. Jeanette, Jeanette is definitely doing a bit better, but could definitely be better. Um, and for holding those in prayer that we've been encountering. And God is above everything. Everything. Nothing is above him. So we thank you for holding them in prayer. And um, I'll give you feedback as the week goes. Okay, let us bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, for the platform, the ability to be able to send your word out there, touching the lives of your people, touching my life, Lord. I thank you, Lord, even as you've given me the privilege to minister to your children today, that Holy Spirit that you ministered to me as I was ministering. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you taught us. You took the time to come down from heaven, not only to go to the cross and lay down your life, but to spend years on earth, on earth teaching us how to live, how to handle situations and how to handle challenges, that we may, by emulating you, learn from you, Father. Learn from you, Lord. Learn that though you are not your Holy Spirit, your word says, Lord, that you will send the Holy Spirit. And your word says, it is better that I go, that the Holy Spirit might come. And I pray, Lord, that the words that were spoken this morning <clears throat> would find the good ground of our hearts as it was sown. Your word says that the word of God is seed. And I speak that the seed of the word of God that was sown this morning the ground will be good it will flourish and bear fruit that we will father not only become hearers of your word but doers and we will practice those things that you outline for us in the word that when we are faced with any problem our faith will rise up in each and every person that listens this morning i speak that their faith will be stirred up and would rise up no matter whatever challenge they face, whatever problem, whatever wall, Lord God Almighty, precious Heavenly Father, 
I ask you, Lord, convict our hearts that we would call upon you incessantly, never failing, praying without ceasing, praying with faith, standing the test of faith, examining our lives, coming before you with a humble heart, coming in repentance, coming forgiving everyone that has wronged us, coming with humility, guarding against the spirit of pride. I speak all of this into the, those that hear the message now. In the name of Jesus, whether this message is heard now, in two hours, in two days, in 20 years time, the same conviction, the same mighty Holy Spirit that resurrected the Lord Jesus, that resurrected Lazarus, is here. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Master. I thank you, wonderful Holy Spirit. Seal the word in the heart of your people. Help us that we may hide your word in our hearts, that we may not sin against you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sustaining us during the fast, for keeping us. And I thank you, Lord, for the avalanche of breakthroughs that will result from those of us that seek your face. For you are the God of breakthroughs, you are the God of miracles, the God of the impossible. I thank you, Lord God Almighty. I speak right now the blood of Jesus. And I declare liberally the blood of Jesus covers each and every one of us that listen right now, including myself and our family, and every person out there that's listening and their families and the homes and the children and the marriages and the cars and the businesses and the occupations and the finances. For every member of KFPA, whether they're listening now or not, whether they will listen later, the blood of Jesus, I declare, covers you all. And the bloodline of protection is drawn around each and every one of us and our families and all that we possess. As we stay behind the bloodline, no enemy force will penetrate the bloodline. I command you that you will pass over. You cannot come near the mighty blood of Jesus. Thank you for your protection, Father. Hold us in the hollow of the palm of your hand. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Bless us in this week. Let the blessing rain from this Lord's Day to the next Lord's Day as we wait with eager anticipation for the breakthroughs and the testimony that will come forth from the fast, Lord. We thank you for the healing of for your people, Lord God Almighty. And now may, and now may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace, the intimacy and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we meet again in person or telephonically. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you.